good evening. Um, it's 6 a.m. here and it's all kinds of times between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. between me and the other two speakers that we have today. Um, welcome to my dining room. Uh, it's really nice to be here with all of you today, although I do wish we were in Costa Rica instead. Um, before I introduce myself, I, I just want to and, and introduce the panel. I really want to give a huge shout out to Nikki Gladstone and the rest of the RightsCon team and Tech Change for doing this phenomenal feat of bringing RightsCon, which is really a community um, and, and bringing that element of community online. Um, we can't do a thank you in the chat because there's no chat for this session, but if you could say thank you on Twitter and, and join me and just really sort of applauding them, um, that would be a brilliant thing to do. Um, so I'm Amy Studdar. I work on digital democracy at the International Republican Institute, um, which is a democracy assistance organization that works in over 100 countries. Uh, I am also the founder and CEO of a civic tech startup called Villager. Um, we are here today to talk about Democracy 2030. Uh, so when I first pitched this session idea to the RightsCon team, um, the world was not even as terrible as it is today, although we thought it was pretty terrible. Uh, and the theory was that, you know, um, we've been talking a lot about disinformation, digital authoritarianism, all of the various ways in which the digital world threatens democracy. Uh, but we didn't really have somewhere that we were trying to go with democracy. We weren't talking about all of the ways in which we could embrace digital to make democracy thrive, to support democratic principles. Um, and without a roadmap of where it was that we were trying to go, how could we really beat the bad guys? What is it that we're actively trying to build? Um, so I'm joined today by uh, two of the most thoughtful people on this subject. They're not just thoughtful, though. They're also doers. Um, the first person uh, that I'll introduce is Audrey Tang, who is the digital minister in Taiwan and who really encapsulates this idea of um, First of all, just a positive spirit about humanity that says we can harness digital to, you know, bring the best out of humanity and has really been doing that partially through her activism in the first place um, and then through government going forward. And then I'm also going to jump over to Nanjala Niabola, who uh, wrote this really fantastic book, which if you haven't bought, you absolutely should, called Digital Democracy Analog Politics. It's a study of Kenya um, and how this has played out in Kenya, but really it's so broadly applicable to the rest of of the world as well. Um, and the idea that she really gets into is that, you know, democracy isn't just, uh, democracy isn't just about the institutions and processes that run our politics, but also about participation. Um, and if you look at participation and you look at civil society and you look at the spirit of, you know, how people operate, um, then uh, then you really start to get a sense of what democracy could look like in the future. Um, so Audrey, we will start with you. Um, my first question for you is, you know, you, you really have led the transition in Taiwan of what this has looked like from analog politics, um, digital democracy sort of brought about this revolution in Taiwanese politics. You were part of the revolution. Um, and now you're starting to see that institutionalized within Taiwan as part of political processes and government. Um, but there was really this democratic spirit that started from the grassroots and then bubbled up to government. Could you talk a little bit about that experience and, and what it's like to be part of that? Certainly. Um, there's a saying that anything uh, that was around when we're born uh, is human nature and anything that's introduced after we're born is technology. Uh, and in that sense, uh, in Taiwan, democracy is very much a technology. When I was born, we were still under the martial law. There was no freedom of speech, of assembly, of the press and so on. Both my parents were journalists and they have to constantly walk this very thin line between self-censorship and state censorship. Uh, but then around uh, 89 or so it was the popularization of both personal computers and the lifting of the martial law. We began to experiment on various ways of democracies. We have uh, amended our constitution uh, several times, uh, seeing that the constitution itself is also a kind of technology. And when we had our first freely contested uh, presidential election in 1996, uh, that was uh, already when the World Web has been introduced and that dropped out of junior high school with a full blessing of the head of school, 
uh, to start entrepreneurship on web technology. So in Taiwan, internet and democracy are not two things. They uh, co-evolved with each other, and that's why we brought a lot of those internet governance ideas like rough consensus, radical transparency, and so on into our uh, norms, uh, our political norm. So when in 2014, uh, the MPs at the time were refusing to deliberate substantially with stakeholders, the cross Strait Service and Trade Agreement, or CSSTA, half a million people went to the street, occupied the parliament, many more online, and I'm one of the people who helped to broadcast that uh, conversation, the Sunflower conversation, uh, with uh, all the different aspects of the CSSTA as deliberated by more than 20 different NGOs at a time, including, for example, whether we should allow PRC components, um, People's Republic of China regime components in our 4G uh, telecom infrastructure, which is, I guess, six years before any other country have deliberated that topic. And so it's a demonstration but it's not a protest only, it's a demo of uh, the facilitation, listening and skill skills that internet can provide because unlike broadcast and television, instead of one person speaking to thousands of people, internet enabled thousands and tens of thousands of people to listen to one another and come to rough consensus, which was then ratified by the head of the parliament. And so it was a successful Occupy. And so I'm kind of just a channel to bring those energy into our decision making. And that's partly how we enhance democracy during the pandemic of which were uh, on the post-pandemic stage for more than 100 years, uh, sorry, 100 days now, yeah. 100 years post-pandemic sounds wonderful. Uh, 100 days. Yeah, that's far future, isn't it? <laughs> Sitting in the US, 100 days would also be really nice. In fact, we take one day of post-pandemic at this point. Um, I want to dig in a little bit on the principles question that you raised, which I think is just so critical to how we think about embracing digital for the purposes of democracy. You know, we sort of shifted from this framework that was the internet is inherently democratizing because it allows people access to information and capacity to talk to each other and it democratizes the information space to surveillance capitalism and digital authoritarianism. And this is inherently terrible for humanity and for democratic participation, um, both of which I think are absolutely incorrect. And I hope that, you know, as we're thinking about this 2030 framing, I think that one of the, the ways in which we have to get there is we have to think about the principles that underpin our use of the internet, right? How is it that we're using the digital space as government, as people? What is it that we're expecting of each other within the digital environment um, as we move toward this kind of future democracy? Um, Taiwan, and, and, and when you've spoken about this in the past, really you start with these underlying principles, right? Like you talk about open data and the open source movement. You talk about transparency and accountability. Uh, you also talk a lot about trust. Um, could you talk about what those principles are and why you think that they've been, I don't want to say easy to institute, but easier to institute within the Taiwanese context um, than they have been elsewhere. Why is it that in Taiwan you have an, and, and within the sort of GovZero and the Sunflower Movement and then the government that has followed from that, why is it that you've been able to embrace these principles as part of the digital revolution? Certainly. Um, digital technology is a great amplifier, right? It amplifies surveillance capitalism. It amplifies totalitarianism. Before digital technology, totalitarians are sub-totalitarian, and now it could be totally totalitarian. Uh, but in Taiwan's case, because as I mentioned, democracy is itself seen as a technology that we can iterate, that we can improve. Uh, I have uh, boiled down the core principles of social innovation and digital democracy into three easy to remember pillars, and those are fast, fair, and fun. And these are the guiding principles um, for our uh, uh, counter coronavirus work. These are guiding principles of our counter disinformation work. Um, it has to be fast in the sense that people's ideas um, get reverberated into this pro-social media rather than anti-social social media so that new ideas very quickly become uh, collective decisions amplified uh, into the entire country. It needs to be fair so that people understand that we do not impose lockdowns or takedowns, but instead challenge the society to come up uh, with 
was, for example, fair ways to ration the medical mask to design incentive. For example, wearing a mask is to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands. Um, basically, these ideas are more uh, equally distributed uh, throughout the society, have a higher R value of memes. And finally, the fun part, also important, make sure that uh, we use this humor over rumor way instead of takedowns to fight an infodemic. Uh, we just work on very interesting internet memes with our spokes dog and things like that to make sure that our clarifications are by itself funny and that people can look at public participation not as something that's very serious or very polarized, but anything that people can contribute to. I'm happy to expand on that in the later questions. Fast, fair, and fun. Fast, fair, and fun. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so now we're going to jump to Nanjala. Hi, Nanjala. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Hi. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, so I attempted to distill your arguments about digital democracy, analog politics, right? This idea that we have, and I'm going to attempt to do it again, but then I'm going to ask you to do it better. Um, so this idea that, you know, um, the internet has been democratizing in various different ways. People are using it in a democratic way. Uh, grassroots is using it. It has democratized the information space to varying extents. But politics has remained analog, right? Our institutions haven't kept up. We just haven't adjusted the processes, the democratic processes around that. Could you talk about that a little bit and where that came from and how you've seen it play out in the context you've been looking in? Sure. Um, I think for me, one of the most uh, telling and one of the really most interesting things that Audrey has touched on is the idea of intent and how the internet is not necessarily just this ambiguous thing that's happening in, in this uh, ill-defined space, but it's something that is built to reflect our intentions and to re reflect our interests as communities. And so one of the things that we are, uh, that I wanted to really explore in my book and in my research was how do the intentions and how do the, does the agency of the people who build platforms intersect with um, how the platforms sort of play out? Um, how does the politics of the society intersect with how the, the platforms and the internet and, and all the technology kind of is, uh, plays out in these respective societies? And I focused on Kenya specifically because um, it's not just because I'm from Kenya and, I, and I'm, I'm in Kenya, but also because Kenya represents um, you know, what are this, uh, these developments look like in, on the cusp, you know. Um, for so long, the internet conversation was dominated by the West, was dominated by, uh, and the East, and the, and the idea that the places where the technology were being, was being built is where uh, the conversations were going to be the hottest and the most interesting. But really what's ended up happening is this, um, because of the legal context and the social political context in a lot of the developing world, but actually the debates that now um, uh, the, the West and the East, the places where the technology is being built, now they're grappling with are things that uh, we've been dealing with for the better part of the last 10, 15 years. And so it really was a case of looking back at how tech and politics had intersected in, in Kenya, seeing what lessons made there, seeing the, the questions of agency and the questions of intent, how they intersected with outcomes, how they intersected with outputs, and, and sort of trying to see, well, what can the rest of the world learn from what happened um, in Kenya, what hap what's happening in other parts of the developing world. And the main lesson is this, that you cannot understand how technology is going to affect a society unless you understand that society, unless you understand the political, social history of that society, you won't be able to predict how, how tech is going to, to play out. You won't be able to understand why mobile money is a big deal in one country and does nothing at all in a neighboring country if you don't understand how the dynamics of that particular country play out. Um, and that's really what I try to remind people um, that tech doesn't happen without people. And I love what Audrey said about um, the about the, the, the democracy as being part of the tech story, as, as democracy being a form of technology. You're not going to understand the society if you don't understand the tech behind that society. The, the, sorry, you don't understand. You're not going to understand how tech is going to affect a society if you don't understand the society. Yeah, absolutely. So um, at IRI, my work in the past when one could travel, um, really took me all over the world, um, and uh, and you know we would try and come up with 
approaches, right? How do we help societies and politics navigate this transition to digital democracy um, in ways that are consistent and uniform and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And at some point, I think we realize like there's no one size fits all approach. You have to start from what is it that people are already doing and how do you embrace that? What are the problems that people are trying to fix in their everyday lives? Because democracy is really about, you know, delivering on those needs and technology as a way of enabling that as well. Um, I want to get into this question of principles, though, because I do think that those can be universalized, right? Like when we're imagining a democracy 2030, yes, the processes and the systems and the ways in which we deliver on principles is going to be different on the basis of every single society that exists and not just each national society, but also every city, every interest group, etc. Um, but we can get to the principles. Um, and, and you sort of get into this in your book a little bit where you're talking about, you know, um, the democratization of information, unequal distribution of access, um, et cetera. So imagining democracy 2030, what do you think the consistent mm -hmm. principles are that need to underpin whatever it is that we're trying to build for the future? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I wish more people kind of push themselves to really reflect on, okay, what does that mean? Like it's, it's, we're in a state where everybody's just like criticizing, 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 and we recognize that the criticisms are valid and there's something that needs to be fixed, but what is that something that needs to be fixed is a, is a really fantastic question. I think one thing I would say is that access is really important, but access cannot be used as a substitute for being intentional about the platforms that we build and the, the spaces that we create on the internet. It's not enough to just say we're going to put a mobile phone in everybody's hand. Um, we also have to think very critically about um, what kind of behaviors, what kind of, um, uh, like for example, in right now we're talking about um, gambling, online gambling, mobile gambling in Kenya. And, and there's a lot of actual investment, there's a lot of push, there's a lot of advertising, there's a whole ecosystem that's being built around gambling, which has led to a really huge problem with addiction, especially amongst young unemployed people. And that's a thing that, you know, putting a mobile phone in everybody's hand without critiquing what kind of advertising, what kind of um, access are we encouraging, I think is leading us to a bit of a, of a quandary here in Kenya where we're going to have to think critically about um, uh, the principle behind it. So one thing I would think about is access cannot be a substitute for intent. Access cannot be a substitute for the more complex moral conversations about the kind of ecosystem that we're building. Um, I think uh, one thing that is co comes up a lot in conversations here in, in Africa is ownership. And what does effective ownership look like? What does inclusive ownership look like? What should a company be able to make money off a country without necessarily being invested in the social, uh, political outcomes. And ownership doesn't necessarily mean money. No, we're thinking about community ownership. We're thinking about um, community oversight. We're thinking about community participation in, in charting how these technologies play out. So to think critically about bringing more people on board and bringing more communities on board in the decision-making processes, in the um, building and deployment processes, I think is really important. We're not just talking about putting a token, uh, you know, a token African on the board or a token African on, on the ownership or the leadership team, but we're talking about actually being engaged with the communities in which our tech is being deployed. Um, are we thinking about what content moderation is going to look like, for example, in the societies where we're launching our apps? Um, and that means uh, being in constant active conversation with the communities that, that we're participating in this top-down approach of building tech in Silicon Valley or building tech in, you know, in China, whatever, and then sort of deploying it in context halfway around the world with no follow-up, no support, no engagement. I think also we have to push back on that. I think we have to realize that the world is a really, we're deeply interconnected. Um, one thing that we should learn, is that, especially from this emergency, is that one part of the world gets sick and we are all at risk. We're all going to be vulnerable. So we have to work together. And that in a tech space means actively bringing communities and societies along and not just doing this top-down deployment of, of tech and platforms without any sense of responsibility. I think we have to, we have to fix that. So um, 
I'm encouraged by the fact that a lot more people are thinking through about these issues, civic tech and, and you know, community-based development, but I think we still have a little bit more work that we can do in that regard. I mean, just off the top of my head, these are some of the principles I think about. Yeah, absolutely. We have a long way to go, but we are going to get there by 2030, if the premise of this panel said. Um, when I was doing yeah. promo for the panel, I, I said that we were going to cure 2020. I'd also like to cure inequality, uh, <laughs> discrimination, all of that. <laughs> Oh, that these are the sustainable right, development then. goals, things that people promise to cure by 2030. All 169 wow. of them. <laughs> so, I mean, the where, only where, are we going to start with this panel? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the only Truly trying to cure in this panel is politics, and I think that everything can stem down from there. Um, but Nanjala, when you were speaking, you you referenced a lot the sort of Silicon Valley commercial model around all of this, but I think this community-driven idea and this idea that it shouldn't be top down should also be applied to government, right? To our institu the institutions and processes of government. And this um, sort of harks back to in the good old days um, when we, most people were still optimistic about things, um, Tim O'Reilly wrote this wonderful paper called Government as a Platform. And the idea was that government as a technology is really just supposed to be a collective of the people working together to achieve societal goals, right? Um, it's it's interesting to me because I think that what you were talking about, Nanjala, is precisely that that question of how do we get rid of this hierarchy of the top down, uh, then telling the sort of the consumer or the citizen what to do, and that's really what we've seen Audrey kind of encapsulate in her work in Taiwan, which is to completely overturn this old structure of what government looked like uh, that was really a top down hierarchy and say no when you harness the energy of the people, when you trust the people, when you use this incredible technology to do that, to do it efficiently, to bring people into the conversation, you come up with better solutions and you come up with more buy-in for those solutions. Um, Audrey, could you talk a little bit about that? You can you know, use the recent context of disinformation or COVID, um, but I'd really love to hear about how you've worked with GovZero, how you've translated that spirit of you know, the nobody of GovZero um, into government. services in Taiwan is something that GOV, that TW, but people who don't like the services that the government was providing uh, invented a way uh, to basically provide the same services, for example, an overview on budgets and so on, but using exactly the same domain name, but with the O changed to a zero. So you would go to budget.g0v.tw to see the shadow government's imagination of the government services, always more interactive and always relinquishing the copyright. It has been adapted uh, to other jurisdictions as well. For example, g0v.it is the Italian uh, version of the gov0 and so on. And so the idea of forking the government, uh, I need to pronounce it right, fork the government, uh, is uh, for the civil society, for the social sector to provide running examples of how the government should work and relinquish the copyright so that the government can take after the people. And I will uh, say that this is uh, goes beyond the original idea in the government as a platform in the Tim O'Reilly's book, because that was still, you know, instead of for the people, we need to work with the people, but now we're working after the people. Uh, and so just two very quick examples. For example, uh, whereas many uh, jurisdictions began countering coronavirus only this year, Taiwan started last year. And last year, uh, last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted that there are seven new SARS cases in Wuhan, he would get inquiry and eventually punishment from his local political institutions. But at the same time, the Taiwan social sector, the equivalent of Reddit, but owned by a social sector, actually just random bunch of students in the uh, National Taiwan University called the PTT, is a bulletin board system, has somebody just reposting that and people upvoting it. And our medical officers immediately noticed this and issue an order that people flying in from Wuhan need to start health inspections on the first day of 2020. And so this shows that the civil society actually has a collective intelligence that is even more 
intelligent than the state intelligence. But the civil society trusts mm -hmm. the government enough mm -hmm. to talk about possible SARS outbreaks in the public forum, and that the government trusts the citizens enough to treat it as if SARS has happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003. And so that's the example of the collective intelligence. And another example, which is the fairness pillar, um, stems from the people uh, in Tainan, uh, that's the southern city of Taiwan, in the beginning, when we ramp up the facial mask production, making sure everybody can uh, collect masks from nearby stores and pharmacies and so on, people wouldn't trust that the distribution was fair, that we were indeed uh, increasing the production uh, and so on. And so uh, Howard Wood uh, had this idea that he would just uh, do a ushahidi, <laughs> meaning that he would just build this uh, map and asking his friends and families to mark on the map uh, which uh, pharmacies or which convenience stores at the time still has um, maps. Uh, this, uh, so you can see like this uh, says that the mask level of this particular pharmacy uh, is this for adults and this for children and so on. Uh, the only thing with this, uh, like people contributed uh, source is that it uh, very soon overwhelms the, the bills. Uh, that is to say, how after just a couple of days, uh, owed Google 20K US dollars uh, because he overused this uh, Google map um, API. And so that's where the GovZero people came in because GovZero is specialized uh, in helping out the civic technologist. And so Howard Wood goes on the GovZero chat room, says, I have this problem with my bills. Can we uh, build some way that doesn't uh, require people to um, just uh, report the numbers. And I'm, of course, one of the people who contributed to his bill. And so I just brought his idea to the premier, Premier Su Zhenchang, who immediately see the value of it and say that we need to trust citizens with open data. And so right away, after 24 hours, we started rolling out this um, real name uh, rationing of the masks so that anyone with the National Health Insurance card can use any of those 100 or more tools, including maps, but also for people with blindness, um, you know, uh, chatbots, voice assistants, and so on, to find a nearby pharmacy, use their National Health card to get nine masks now every two weeks if you're an adult, 10 if you're a child, and trust the people queuing before and after them to uh, participatory keep this accountable. That is to say, if you swipe your NHI card and you get nine masks, people after you will refresh their chatbot or their map and actually see the stock level deplete. Otherwise, they will call this toll-free number to report something uh, that is wrong. So this is a distributed ledger. Uh, participatory made accountable by the pharmacists and so on, analyzed by uh, independent analysts uh, who built dashboard to uh, suss out the oversupply and undersupply lines and eventually prompted the government uh, to work with convenience stores so we can deliver this 24 hours. And this whole process was not under the traditional top-down procurement laws. This is what I call reverse procurement. The civil society built this working prototype that won public acclaim, the media reported it, uh, and the economic sector such as Google uh, agreed, of course, to waive his API usage fees eventually. And so all it's left for the government to do is ensuring timely access in a mission-to-mission -mission fashion to the real-time uh, stock levels of all the pharmacies. And so this is what I call reverse procurement. It can appear here very instantly and when the people there said oh, oh, what about people with blindness and things like that instead of by the traditional uh, tender and uh, uh, public tender route we would just say oh here is the API build your chatbot and so Google Voice Assistant Siri and so on very quickly started uh, with people who contribute uh, plugins and extensions that allow people to confirm that it was fair so that is also the fairness principle and that's my second example. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so Nanjala, I'm gonna come to you next. Um, in your book, you use the example of Chase Bank, um, which was this bank in Kenya that massively uh, collapsed and it was ruinous for so many people's personal financial situations as, as well as just really damaging for the economy more broadly. Um, there's, and it, the reason that you use that story is because there was this sort of assertion that the outpouring of rage on social media was part of what led to the collapse, right? So there's one response to that situation that says, um, openness, free conversation is why this happened, right? This is this was bad yeah. because of the openness and the capacity for dialogue. Um, what Audrey is describing is that actually more openness is what this period calls for, mm -hmm. right? Like if there had been 
in that situation, had there been more transparency, had there been more data, then the underlying issues would never have happened or they would have been caught earlier. Um, so these are really sort of two completely different ways of looking at what the digital era means for politics and for society. Um, one says, clamp down on information, we need more control. And another says, no, the way forward is openness and this is how we embrace it. Um, do you think that, you know, the Taiwan case is very special because it's, you know, this wonderful homogenous, kind of, I, I, not to say it's not wonderful because it's homogenous, but it's a, a wonderful and homogenous country where there isn't as much, you know, diversity and difference of opinion and so much chaos in the politics, um, whereas you have other places that are a little bit more chaotic in their politics. So do you think that this openness and this kind of sense of social cohesion is replicable elsewhere? Um, or do you think that it's sort of unique to Taiwan and it's not something that we can imagine for democracy 2030 for the rest of the world? Um, I hope Audrey will forgive me for bringing this up, but I remember a couple of days ago, there was the pictures of the Taiwanese parliament and people were throwing water balloons um, at each other. And there was like a big hollow balloon um, in the parliament. And, and I bring that up with respect to say that I think we over we tend to oversimplify you know, what Taiwan, I mean, I think maybe Taiwan isn't as diverse as you know the DRC, which has 600 ethnic groups or um, you know, Kenya, which has 40, but it's, it's definitely not a linear sort of political space. And that I bring that up to say that I think the rest of the world, oh, for many of us, we are laboring under the illusion that there's only two ways of doing, two models of doing government. There's the American model and there's the Chinese model. And you oscillate between the two. And the reality is that there is so much more um, out there that in a planet of over 7 billion people, we cannot have exhausted the levels of creativity and innovation that there exist into the types of governments that we can live under. And as a, that's a preface to say that when I listen to, to, to Audrey speak, I hear something that I, I also underscored in my book, which is technology cannot be a substitute for trust. The government must earn the trust of the people in order to have the collaborative spirit with the people to build the kind of technology that the people need. I think for many people, in many societies, government has misunderstood the point of government, that people are aspiring to be in government so that they can have power, and power that they then use to opt out of the difficulties and the challenges that face their people. And again, the pandemic is an excellent moment to reflect on the fund fundamentals of government and governance. That the Chase Bank example is really a symptom of what we were, we're living under now, whereby the government is misrepresenting numbers about infections, is misrepresenting numbers about hospital capacity, is misrepresenting numbers about PPE availability because they want to look good. And not because they're thinking, well, actually, it's bad for Kenya if Kenyans get sick and if Kenyans lose their family members and if there's a problem. And so instead of working together in partnership and thinking, how can we enhance trust and how can we be in a collaborative uh, context with our citizens, there is the power domination top down, we will impose a way and, and, and as an organization on the people. And I just don't think that's what the point of government is. I don't think that's the point of governance. And I think that the illusion that political science has sold that this is it, you're either living under an authoritarian centralized administration or you're living under a capitalist exploitative system is a false promise. And the, the societies that are doing the best right now, New Zealand, Taiwan, South Korea, you know, even Germany are societies where people are thinking, well, what else can government do? You know, I saw uh, Jacinda Adern um, say, you know, one of the first things that she did when she came into office is she displaced GDP as a metric for progress and started to look at mental health and wellness and, and social securities as metrics of society that's doing well. Once you change the underlying epistemology of what you think government is for, the underlying logic of what you think government is for, suddenly everything starts to look a little bit different. And these soft values that political science and international relations have sort of pushed to the back burner suddenly look incredibly important. Trust, respect, um, honesty, openness. Those are not just things to teach your kids when they're young, that then we, when they turn 18, we say, well, actually that doesn't matter anymore because now you're an adult and the world is terrible and you just have to adapt. 
what if those became the core organizing principles of why we govern? What would the future look like if a government came to its people and said, hey, we need your help to navigate this and we're not just going to impose it upon you? And that's why the examples that Audrey has given us so powerful to you because they're, they're, they start to expand the imagination beyond just tech. What if we fundamentally change the reasons why we govern to move away from power and domination to our openness and trust and inclusivity and, and representation? And um, I think that's where the future lies, really. I think every, this pandemic is telling us, go back to the drawing board. Go back to the drawing board and think why you think tech uh, is important. It's not to help you with surveillance. It's not to help you with control. It's not to help you with power and domination. It's to help you have a better conversation with the people that you claim to govern. That to me is, is where um, you know, 2030, that's kind of where we should be aspiring towards. Nanjala, you make my heart sing. I might just start crying now. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> what you're describing is precisely why I do the work that I do. And I, evidently it's true for Audrey as well. You know, I think um, the reason that government is hierarchical and has been hierarchical and has had these structures in place is because we didn't have this technology that exists today, right? We had to, for the sake of efficiency and communication, you couldn't have a collective conversation among everyone. You couldn't have collective trust. And so you had to have systems and structures. And if that's no longer necessary, how do we need to redesign everything from the ground up so that we are embracing what I think you're describing, which is more democracy, more participation, more inclusion, more creativity from the people, more government as service and as platform than government as power. Um, Audrey, you're nodding and, and clearly enthusiastic about everything Nanjela has said. So I want to give you a, a chance to respond without dominating this conversation as well. Well, I, I think the point uh, Nigella made about epistemology really is very important. Uh, epistemology is the idea of how we derive knowledge and a lot of the knowledge that we derive is based on um, age old metaphors. Of, for example, we say voting uh, without thinking that it's just what three bits every four years uploaded uh, per person. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have certainly better technologies now. Uh, and so I still uh, think that the words that we use to talk about things is very important. For example, um, when we talk about smart cities, I always prefer to talk about smart citizens. Uh, and in fact, my own job description is a kind of massive search and replace um, of the old, uh, more hierarchical use of tech words uh, to a more open, more pluralistic word uh, of digital possibilities. My uh, job description, which was written almost four years ago now, uh, which is pinned on my Twitter, uh, I think uh, may provide a good footnote to the epistemological change that uh, I personally would really like to see in 2030. It's very short, it goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let's always keep in mind the plurality is here. I love that. The plurality is here. Um, if that's not democracy 2030, then I don't know what is. That's really fantastic. Um, so I'd like now, we've had these really wonderful conversations about principles and sort of the underlying structures, but I'd love now to talk about how we make that happen, right? Like, what is it that we need to do concretely to take these principles, to take these ideas and turn them into reality? Um, so there's this wonderful quote, and I think it's Bill Gibson, and I should have looked this up before the panel, but I didn't, um, not using Google appropriately. Uh, but the um, the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed, right? And 2030 is not so far out in the future, so we're not gonna come up with anything radical and new about how we, um, how we govern and what politics looks like, but we can scale up what works. Um, so Nanjala, I'll jump to you first. And this doesn't have to be about government processes or institutional processes. It can just be about, you know, even people's behavior or how people are working together to improve their society. It can also about, be about government and processes. But where do you see the future already existing? And what do you think is scalable? 
I, I think one of the things that I, I spent an inordinate amount of time in my book looking at was how people were organizing online. I think one of the reasons why social media has ended up being so important to political conversations in many African countries is because the people who built the platforms had no idea what was happening. And so it was a space that was allowed to develop somewhat organically and with a lot of caveats, obviously, issues of access and issues of you know who can afford the bandwidth, who can afford to participate. But just because there was no, no external pressure to commercialize these conversations and to turn them into something else, the very early days of social networking um, in many African countries were such a great example of what citizens can do when given the room to have honest conversations with, between each other and with their leaders and to turn online spaces into uh, microcosms of the kind of societies that they wanted to live in. And I give the example of the multi-ethnic conversations that are happening in Kenya. You know, when you study Kenyan political science, they tell you about Kenya is an ethnic country and people are, you know, voting along ethnic lines and the ethnicities, everything. But you had these amazing examples of people mobilizing way beyond the ethnic scope, way beyond the regional scope to, you know, provide healthcare for someone who needed it, to support businesses, to expand political conversations, to provide election observation missions, um, you know, that, that sort of challenged the official state narrative, which was a compromise at the time. And so I think that when we see the kind of agency and creativity and innovation that happened in those early days, that's something that I would love to see more of. How can we create spaces for citizens in countries around the world to engage directly with each other and with their governments, right? And, and to really challenge the stereotypes and the, the um, what do we say, the, the shorthand narratives that have evolved around how their societies work. How do we incubate that good and make it grow? Um, without the online space, as I argue in, in many platforms, without the online space, we would not have seen this tremendous expansion of LGBTQ plus representation in public discourse in Kenya, that the traditional media, which would never have given a, 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 a movie with two female leads the time of day, a love story with two female leads the time of day, now inviting a director of, of such a film to say, hey, you've produced the best, the second best performing commercial film in Kenyan history, how does that feel? This all happened because, you know, LGBTQ plus Kenyans, their allies were able to go online and find each other and push back on this very um, stereotypical narrative that, you know, being gay is not African, et cetera. Those are the kind of conversations that I think um, we want to find a way of incubating that good. People want to talk to their governments. People want to talk to each other. People want to live in active uh, communities. Um, they don't want surveillance. They don't want they don't want unnecessary censorship. They don't want um, you know to be turned into be their very personal deep conversation whether for advertising. How do we create platforms and conversations, spaces that make that possible? I think is something that we really should be thinking about in the next couple of years. Wonderful. Um, so Audrey, same question to you. Um, what can we scale up that's already working? Sure. So I talk about reverse procurement, and uh, there's also the idea of reverse mentorship. Uh, in Taiwan, for example, when I was uh, 34 years old, uh, 33, when we freshly occupied a parliament, uh, I was then recruited as a reverse mentor uh, to the then uh, minister uh, Jacqueline Tsai. And the idea of a reverse mentor is that people who are under 35 years old uh, who serve as both a mentor, but also someone who learns alongside a minister, um, basically shadows their work and then suggests new directions because the younger people do not take anything for granted. Uh, they do not have this legacy system running in their brain. So the idea goes is that the younger people should point out the new directions, whereas the people in the older generations provide a kind of resource and power to make those uh, new directions happen. So that's how, for example, the Vita One consultation method, uh, we deliberated uh, the legalization of Uber uh, strategies using AI-based uh, listening and skill conversations uh, first get uh, deployed in Taiwan. Um, and so now, of course, I'm over 
35 years old. And so we work with uh, new uh, reverse mentors and they're 35. Uh, just today, we actually work with um, more than a dozen reverse mentors in this very building, uh, talking about the new directions, how we need to power up the people uh, who are specifically uh, interested in uh, skills, uh, like winners of the World Skills Competition and so on, and basically treat them as we would to Olympic athletes and making sure that not only get on the National Day Parade, but actually integrate into the uh, basic schools and high school education so that uh, the younger children who aspire not academically, but to a uh, technical proficiency have a role model to look up to and they can improve the community and the buildings uh, by themselves and building this uh, learning circle regardless of the age to a lifelong learning and so on. And all this is proposed by people uh, who are not even 30 years old and they serve as reverse mentors uh, to Minister of Labor and Economy in this particular case. So all the 12 ministries related to social innovation now work regularly, uh, I think about two reverse mentors uh, per ministry. So that's an idea that I would see, uh, like to see more people adopt. The other idea is the participation officers network that we have established after 2016. The idea is that we have media officers in the uh, cabinet uh, in each ministry talking to journalists. We have, uh, for example, the parliamentary officers talking to MPs. And so we really need a new uh, branch of officers talking essentially to hashtags. That is to say, when a hashtag is trending, when the outrage starts to burn, uh, even if it's a small thing, uh, like for example, the tax filing system is explosively hostile to Mac users. It seems small, but it would actually uh, enrage a lot of people who had previous uh, bad experiences about digital services uh, in the government. And those participation officers essentially uh, just talk to the hashtag, which doesn't have a single representative, but they can join the conversation saying, everybody who complain about this is cordially invited to the Ministry of Finance to co-create the tax filing experience the next year. Um, and so we did that in 2017 and our tax filing experience the next year have a history high approval rate because thousands of people feel they have contributed at least one post-it note to it. And the participation office of the Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, play a really large role uh, in the uh, uh, counter COVID work because uh, the PO, the participation officer lives with this dog. Uh, and so uh, after each uh, daily Central Epidemic Command Center uh, press conference, um, the officer would just go home and take a photo of the dog and say, hey, if you're indoors, you have to keep three dogs away. If you're outdoor, two dogs away. So translating scientific knowledge into a meme that is fun. You should wear a mask uh, to cover uh, your mouth from your own unwashed hands. Remember the bird to pre-order uh, the mask and so on. And so this memes travel really quickly. And because they're specialized to talk to hashtags, it makes sure that our factual humor <laughs> spreads faster than rumor. And if you laugh about it, it's um, actually you're vaccinated. You're literally unable to feel uh, this uh, conspiracy theory holds any merit uh, in your mind. And so people would, of course, then contribute to the matter of fact discussion rather than panic buying and so on. So this kind of hashtag uh, officers are also what I would like to see more governments adopting. Awesome, which actually leads perfectly into my next request, which is actually to the audience um, and to those of you watching here. Um, so I would love if, unfortunately, we don't we don't have the chat, so you can't participate that way. But on Twitter, if you could do hashtag democracy2030 and then indicate something that you think is working somewhere else that could be scaled up elsewhere, that would be wonderful and it would make my life. So hashtag democracy2030. Um, after this panel, I will be coming and engaging, and I'm sure that Audrey and Daniela will uh, see what you've written as well. Um, OK, so my next question, you are an enlightened government. It's 2020 and you're trying to figure out the future, um, what policies do you enact? Um, some ideas for me would be, you know, open data policies. Okay, we want to be the government of the future, so open data is where it's at. Um, participation officers would be another one. Nanjala, I'll come to you first. What policy should an enlightened government in 2020 be enacting in order to bring about Democracy 2030? And the audience, please answer that question too on Twitter. Um, in the same breath, open contracting, open procurement, um, let people know where their taxes are going, let them know what the money is being spent on, um, much more enhanced public participation, so that public participation is not just a bureaucratic hot huddle, 
but that actually people are able to comment on bills, that people are able to tweet in or to, you know, whatever platform they're using to message in and to, um, you know, say, hey, actually, this senator who said X, Y, Z is wrong because here's a report that was done by this um, organization that shows that that assertion is incorrect. So to bring people actively in in the public participation uh, process, um, in the budget making process, you know, people who are paying taxes, they should have more of a say, especially at the local government level. Where are my taxes going? They might not be able to take a day off work to come and sit into the uh, county budget meeting, but what if we, um, uh, an, an evolved government could say, hey, send me your budget proposals. Today is the day we're having the budget conversation. We're streaming on Vimeo, same as, as Rights Gone, and you can jump in on the chat box and tell us you know, what you think about our budget proposals and, and our digital offices will actually read your contributions and it will feed into what's happening um, on the floor. Move away from the model of just democracies elections, but to actual democracies, the process of constant engaged conversations between citizens and their chosen representatives. And that conversation reflects the evolving needs um, of the citizens at any particular point, um, even if that point is between elections. Those are three things that I could think of that are that a really evolved government should be right at the uh, lead with. I love it. Okay, Audrey, over to you. I will talk about this um, presidential hackathon, which actually I'm wearing the T-shirt. It says presidential hackathon. And we've been uh, running this for the third year now. We're still figuring it out as we go. Uh, but the main idea is instead of a traditional hackathon, which takes like two or three days, we have a three months hackathon that starts people uh, with people just throwing out random ideas uh, into the idea pool. The only thing we ask that they have to uh, sort that idea under one or more of the sustainable development goals, that is to say one of the 17 categories. And then people from any sector can start proposing how they are going to build data collaboratives, that is to say people who pull together their data to solve that particular problem together. So this year we have more than 200 teams. And then comes a round of voting. We use the quadratic voting uh, method. If you have played Civilization VI, uh, you know that method. So the quadratic voting, or QV, basically says anyone in our national participation platform join the GOV.TW, which counts more than 10 million unique uh, visitors out of 23 million people in Taiwan. Each of us gets 99 points, which you can allocate to at most 99 projects, uh, kind of thought voting, uh, one project each. But if you really like one project, for example, if you like the idea of people putting in uh, the water boxes that measures the water pollution level automatically to soothe out uh, which or um, you know uh, plants that's industrial plants pollutes which parts of the arable lands of the organic plants, uh, then you can vote more. So if you vote two votes on that, that's going to cost four points in total, and three votes is going to cost nine and four, sixteen, and so on. Uh, and the idea is that it's quadratic, so the marginal cost of each new vote is the same as marginal you know, return. And so uh, with 99 points, you can only vote nine votes on any particular project. You still have um, some uh, votes left, 18 to be precise. And so with 18 points, you will be motivated to find something else uh, to vote. For example, four votes, which would cost 16, and you still have two points left, and you're motivated to look into two other projects. And then maybe you discover a synergy, so you withdraw some of that back. And so the social preferences, there's no strategic voting. Everybody is motivated to vote up to their knowledge. And so the one that with the highest number of the votes is mo most likely to develop synergies between those various different proposals. And then we coach them to find this uh, trilingual teams, that is to say, people from the private sector, from the social sector, and also from the public sector in each team to prototype their idea for a couple more months. So after the three months uh, of the competition, uh, really uh, people who have demonstrated in the final pitch to the president uh, already see a kind of a glimpse of the future, already uh, 
from their uh, two months or three months prototype. For example, one would say that in the uh, rural or even remote islands, we will use 5G network to connect together people in ambulances, people in the remote places, and the nurses and the doctors and so on with the specialized doctors uh, from the main Taiwan island so that people can trust their local nurses and doctors more. Uh, the only problem, of course, is that it was against the law. We didn't have that part of the telehealth law, but it doesn't matter. It's like a, a sandbox. They can try it out uh, in the three months. And so uh, after this QV round, they would um, get into the final 10 and finally the final five. And it's almost always a collection of augmented collective intelligence with AI and CI elements. And then uh, we hand them a trophy. A trophy is a shape of Taiwan with a micro projector underneath that if you turn on the micro projector, it projects the president herself, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, handing you the trophy. It's a meta trophy. It describes itself, basically saying, whatever you have tried out in the previous three months uh, will become national policy in the next 12 months. This is a presidential power as a hackathon award, uh, five teams uh, every year. So we're expanding our international track a lot next year. Uh, you're welcome to join, but we're still figuring the rules out, especially the quadratic voting and funding part. So if you're interested in that, of course, I'm also on the board of Radical Exchange uh, with Glenn Weil and Vito Buttering, Danielle Allen. We're still trying to figure out this uh, drinking our own champagne in our decision-making system. But the whole idea is that when the governance rules gets experimented on the, say, Ethereum community, we take it into the presidential hackathon, which is this meta sandbox that will prompt new ideas and the presidential power, the power that used to be top down, uh, can be shared uh, using this kind of token uh, as trophies. That's wonderful. So we only have three minutes left. Um, the question that I'd like to end on, uh, and this is again for all of you watching, hashtag democracy 2030. Um, it's 2030. You are a human being in society, hopefully in democracy. Um, you're very happy about the way that the world is. What does that mean? What's the very best thing about 2030 in your role as a citizen and as a human in the world? Um, Audrey, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Nanjala and you only have 30 seconds to answer. Certainly. So I will be most happy uh, if all of the Taiwan's uh, 20 or more national languages um, can uh, enable this co-presence using 5G or 6G since we're talking about 2030, so that not only human have voting rights, but according to our indigenous culture, the Savia, the tip of Taiwan, which is still growing every year, two and a half centimeter because of the earthquakes, they can also vote. The rivers can also vote. People uh, who uh, basically can suffer, anyone can suffer, can vote. And that includes not only animals, but also the entire um, landscape, including the oceans and the mountains and so on, so that we will include uh, maximally, this is like populism with a wider population, uh, things that uh, were treated as things, uh, and we will be able to see them as people, as our indigenous cultures teaches us. Mm. Tough, tough, tough to follow. Um, that I am happy that I'm able to pursue my interests without feeling pressure to join the rat race. That I am healthy, that I'm able to see a health practitioner um, whenever I don't feel well with as little obstacle and as little cost between me and that health practitioner. That my environment is clean and protected that um, it's not, the air is not making me sick, the water is not making me sick, it's not making my animals, if I have any, or just the animals that are in it, it's not making them sick. Um, that I am able to participate in the society that I live in um, fully and um, that nobody is suffering so that I might have some measure of advantage or that I am not uh, imposing my advantage on somebody else. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this has been truly one of the greatest pleasures of my professional life so far. And I uh, promise to dedicate myself for the next 10 years of, to making everything that we've talked about today um, a reality. Um, so thank you so much, Audrey and Nanjala. Um, please let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Uh, reach out to me, reach out to Audrey, reach out to Nanjala. This has just been an absolute delight. Thank you to both of you and thank you to RightsCon as well. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Thank you. Wonderful.